Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 2110. Welcome to Vineyard. If you're joining us online, I'm so glad that you're uh, joining us as we go into this series. Uh, we're in week four of Holy Spirit living in third person. Recently, I had a friend who had a high, uh, high-end, high-powered consultant company come in to evaluate his business. He's doing well, but he wanted to just take it to the next level. And so they were with him for almost a week, kind of evaluating everything in his business. They looked at the financials, they looked at his client base, uh, the, his infrastructure, uh, whether his mission, vision, values with those were understood and being lived out within uh, the, the uh, paid st- uh, staff, the employees, the managers, all of them. And so it was very extensive and they gave him pretty thick books and here's all the things that we have evaluated uh, about your company and things you need to change. And then they left. So it was on him to figure out, how do I implement this? I mean, he had all this great knowledge, but how do I actually do it? He didn't, they didn't stay long enough to really figure out people's temperaments and personality styles and the culture within the, 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 the staff and a number of things. So he started spinning out some of the decisions that had been recommended and one after another started going wrong for him. I mean, it just started spinning out. Things were, people were, uh, clients were leaving and just all kinds of crazy stuff happened. And he kind of realized, well, there's a big difference between just knowing uh, what to do and how to do it. Now, the reason I bring that up is because we're talking today about two things. One is, is about knowledge and one about wisdom. Both of them are important. It's not like the, the, the consultant, all the things that they said was not important. That was really important. He paid a lot of money for that information. But there's a wisdom aspect that goes with it. So really, God talks a lot about the power of knowledge and wisdom, especially spiritual knowledge and spiritual wisdom and kind of that, that which is from the source of, the, of, of Almighty God. So we're going to look at that and uh, as I've talked to you uh, the last few weeks, we've kind of looked, we're hanging our hat on this passage out of 1 Corinthians. So if you have your Bible, open it up, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're looking at these particular gifts here that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. And here you can see it says, To one there is given through the Spirit, that's the God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the message of wisdom. <clears throat> to another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues. That's like the, in the next chapter, he says that's like a heavenly prayer language. That's what he's referring to there. And still to another interpretation of tongues. So uh, to help you to remember that, because we are looking at these gifts, uh, you can kind of think of it as, you know, God gives these gifts to the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And in a body, you have a mind. And in the mind, you would have knowledge, wisdom, discerning of spirits or distinguishing of spirits. And then a body also has a mouth. And out of the mouth would come prophecy, would come tongues and interpretation of tongues. And then a body, of course, has hands. And out of hands would come healing, miracles, and faith. So that's that's, it's not actually, it doesn't actually say that. I was just telling you that that's a nice memory aid. If you want to know those nine gifts and be able to kind of, okay, I got those. I understand those gifts are kind of standalone gifts. They're really different than a lot of the other gifts that we find in the Bible. Uh, we've talked about that like in First uh, Peter 4 and Ephesians 4 in, in uh, Romans 12. You have a list of gifts that really are different than these gifts. And so we're going to look a little bit at that today. It says, all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them each one just as He determines. So God determines how He's going to give uh, these gifts. Let me look at uh, three characteristics of these gifts. 
Okay, number one, it says, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, really controlled by God's Spirit. Controlled by God's Spirit. I just mentioned to you that there's other gifts listed in the Bible. There's, uh, you know, like it says, if you have the gift of encouragement, then you should encourage. If you have the gift of serving, then you should serve. If you have the gift of giving, then give and be generous. If you have the gift of leadership, then lead with all diligence. If you have the gift of teaching, then teach. But see, those gifts are, are, are important gifts, and we need to learn those about ourselves, but they're kind of like God's given me these gifts, and now I can use them at will. If you're not sure what your gift is, uh, that's why we do step two. That's we're actually doing that today, right after this, uh, this service. You can go into our growth track, and we're doing step two today. And we do, and it's one, people who take the four growth track classes, most of them say that's their favorite one. Because it's where you, it's more like a lab where you kind of figure out, hey, this is how God wired me. And that's really important to know. So I encourage you to do that. But the gifts we're looking at here in 1 Corinthians 12 they're really more controlled by God. God's the one who determines how they're going to be used and when they're going to be used. It's not like I can just use these, you know, whenever I want. There's kind of this constant dependency on, on God. God's got to kind of come through in the situation. It's, 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 you're kind of like empty-handed every time. Empty-handed. And the, John Wimber, who started the Vineyard Movement, he used to refer to it as these gifts are kind of like, he, he called them like tools in your tool belt. So as you need it, oh, I need that particular tool, that kind of that tool appears. And you get to use it right then and there. But it's God's decision. He's the one who controls uh, how this is used. It says, all these are the work of the one and same spirit. And he gives them to each one just as just as he determines. God determines how they're going to be used and, and, and when. And so there's this dependency, a regular dependency on no matter how long you've been, you know, been a Christian or you've been using your gifts. Secondly is this, that given to us when we ask. So there is an aspect where we should be seeking these. It's, 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 you're, we're not passive. God wants to give us gifts. And so we go to him and we ask, just like any other prayer, you'd say, follow the way of love. And here he says, eagerly desire. When you're eagerly desiring something, you're going to say, hey, I want that. I want that. Spiritual gifts. That's what I eagerly desire, especially the gift of prophecy. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, he says. Again, that's that heavenly language. When you're not sure what to pray, when you want to uh, you know, grow in your in your, in your prayer ability, in your faith capacity, this really helps. This really helps. And so something else he says he wants you to have. And then for this reason, anyone who speaks in the tongue should pray that he may be able to interpret. He says it's even, it's, it's, there's an, a greater blessing when you can actually interpret and you kind of know what's going on there in your prayer language. All of those, the, the, he's saying we should be pursuing that, seeking God. How many gifts would God give you? Well, God really has this unlimited capacity, not just in his resources, but in his love for you to give you. Notice what Jesus says. He says, which of you who, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Nobody's going to do that, right? If not, if you love your kid, he goes, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who? who ask him. He says, he says, I want to give you a lot. I want to give you these gifts. We're often the ones that are going, I don't know, I don't know. Let me ask you, if, how many gifts would a father who's very, very wealthy and very, very generous, how much would a father like that give to his kids over a lifetime? How many gifts do you think he'd give them? I don't know, but a lot, right? I mean, you can just think, well, a lot of gifts. He'd probably be spoiled rotten. I mean, just all these gifts. How many gifts would somebody who's, who's a lover give to their beloved if they were very wealthy and they were very generous? A lot, right? And God says that we are the bride of Christ and that he's romantically involved with you. He loves you. And so he's going to give you gifts, but we need to be in a place where we receive that. Yeah, I want that. I want, I want to operate in those gifts. Then also those gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 are moment by moment, this constant dependency. And you can see this really in some of the verbs uh, that are talked about in these gifts. 
the, the, in the Greek, it's written, the Bible was written in Greek, and they're translating it. And so these, these, these verbs are present tense with a continuous. In other words, it's present tense, continuous. It says, to each one of these is manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So he says it's this idea where it's constantly being given. Now, when you look at other tenses, like the aorist tense, which is past in the Greek, uh, where it's a one, it's like done, it's final. In Hebrews, it says Jesus was given to us, and he died once and for all. It doesn't happen again. It's just kind of, that, that's done. That's in the books. You still benefit from it, but that's done. But he, that's not what he uses here. We see he's saying, no, it's, it's this constant giving. God's giving you more as, as, we're, as, we, uh, as we lean into him. And so that's a challenge, certainly, where we say, God, I, I need this. I, right now, I need this gift. And we're prayerful. We know that he's the one who decides, and he controls that. Now, some critics might say, well, you know, I don't know about all this. Like, for example, the gift of healing. They might go, hey, if you had the gift of healing, you could just go to the hospital and empty it out. And since you can't do that, uh, I don't believe in it. But that's the wrong question. It's not, does the gift of healing, you know, exist? It's who's in control of the gift of healing. And it's God's the one who's in control. He's the one who decides. Jesus went, they had hospitals in Jesus' day. He would go into a hospital. He didn't empty out the hospital. Often one person would come out healed. One person. And so we see Paul, for example, he, you, the apostle Paul, he was used a number of times to bring healing into somebody's life. He would pray for him and they would be healed. But not always, not always. In fact, sometimes his friends, he would pray for them. They weren't healed. One of his friends, whose name was Trophimus. That comes from the word trophy. That's kind of a cool name for your kid. If you're thinking of naming your kid, you know, you're thinking, trophy. Right? I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. He didn't want him sick. He needed him. He was going to go with him. He goes, I had to leave him there. I prayed for him, obviously. Didn't happen. Although other times he did pray for people and they got healed. Timothy, he gives him the advice. Notice what he says to Timothy. He says, stop drinking only water and use a little wine. That's kind of, uh, that's one of my favorite verses, right? You know? <laughs> There's a lot of permission with that, right? Use a little. Maybe we should focus on the word little, but let's go on, okay? A little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. And so that was one of the ways that, you know, with one of their forms of medication. If you remember uh, the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan comes along and helps that guy who had been beaten. And what he gives him, you know, he, he takes care of him, he bandages him, he puts oil on him, he gives him wine. That was, that was a form of medication in those days. And, and he's saying, sometimes you need medication. I mean, I wish it would have worked out. I prayed for you, but it didn't happen. But sometimes it does. It doesn't mean we don't stop, you don't stop praying. It just means it doesn't always happen. I'll talk to you in a few minutes why that happens. So let's look at this. Okay, the first two are the message of wisdom, the message of of, of knowledge. Now, I'm going to reverse them because I think it might be a little easier to explain it by reversing those. It doesn't, I don't think they're necessarily in that order, other, other than the fact that why would he begin with these first two? You know, here he says the knowledge and, and wisdom. He says, to one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom and the other a, a, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. If Paul was going to talk about these, 12, these nine gifts and, um, and really wanted to come in with a splash, you'd think he would like come in with like miracles, right? Or, or, you know, or healing. Those are the big gifts, but not necessarily to his audience. You see, he's writing to the Corinthians. They were Greeks. And for Greeks, knowledge and wisdom was everything. That's what they loved. That's what they, that was... That was their status of, of success. They really, they loved Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, their philosophers. They liked Archimedes and Euclid and Pythagoras, their mathematicians and their scientists. They loved these guys and they quoted them and they knew them. And that was a part of the way that you knew you were successful in their society. Today, we don't necessarily measure success by the philosophers you can quote, right? Today, it would be like, you know, what kind of paycheck? How big is your paycheck? How big is your house? How big are your vacations you can take? How good is your football team doing this year? You know, I mean, this, we have our own measurements. 
If you're a lady, it might be how many glass ceilings have you broken and what kind, what kind of dresses you wear or where you live or how your kids are doing or how much you weigh. I mean, these are all the kinds of status and success things in our society, not so in the Corinthian society. It was all about wisdom and knowledge. So obviously, he comes right out of the gates and says, hey, there, if you want to really experience great wisdom and knowledge, God actually weighs in on this. The Greeks loved wisdom, though. They, they loved wisdom. Now, here's, um, here's how I would define this, this gift, the message of, of uh, or the word. That, that, that when it says message, that word is logos in Greek. It can be translated message or word. Often you might hear, hey, that's a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. It's the same thing, the message. But, but knowing information that's supernaturally given to you, about a person or situation impossible to know any other way. And so you just don't know. You don't know it. And, and sometimes it's better not to know. Because then that kind of drives, the, then, then you're kind of doing it in your own thinking. And so God does something supernatural. And, uh, and some people call it reading. Hey, you read my mail. Or, or sometimes uh, God just starts, you know, uh, animating things that are being said. And they get it. And they go, yeah. There's no way you could have known that. And this is part of what we're talking about with this, uh, the, me- the, the, the message of knowledge. There's a number of examples in the Bible. You have Mary and Elizabeth. Uh, Mary, uh, come, she, she's pregnant now, and she goes to see her cousin. She's pregnant with, with uh, the Son of God. She has Jesus in her. And, and, and now Elizabeth doesn't know what she's going through. They didn't have phones back then. She doesn't know what she's going through. And she has to travel several days to see her from Nazareth all the way down to where she lived, just right outside of Jerusalem. And right when she shows up, Elizabeth has a word. It's a message of knowledge that the baby, she doesn't even know she's pregnant. She goes, you're pregnant, and the baby that's in you is the Son of God. That's, see, that's a word of knowledge. There's no way for her to have known that any other way. Jesus with the fishermen. Jesus is with some fishermen. Uh, Peter and Nathaniel, some of these fishermen, and they've been fishing all night, and they've caught nothing. And Jesus jumps in the boat. He goes, hey, I think things are going to turn your way right now. Why don't you throw the nets in again? And they go, hey, Jesus, uh, I, you're, you know a lot. We get that, but we're like, that's our thing. Man, we're like great fishermen, and we haven't caught a fish, one fish all night. Have you ever had that happen? You go fishing? You're there for hours, and you don't catch anything? It's kind of discouraging, right? Jesus goes up, throw your, throw your net in. They go, okay, because you say we will. Of course, they catch an enormous amount of fish. Jesus got a, that was a word of knowledge. He wouldn't have known that. He didn't know what was going on with the fish. Anna and the infant Jesus. Jesus is just six weeks old. And the parents, Joseph and Mary, bring him to the temple to dedicate him, honoring the tradition of Moses out of Leviticus. And this lady, now, so there's a dedication going on, but there's this other lady, her name's Anna, she just comes up, and she has a word of knowledge. The Bible says that she's 84 years old. 84, that's, that's a good age, right? Just so that you know, a side note, my mother-in-law is 84 years old as of today, right? Isn't that great? So... Anna, she goes up, she has this word, hey, that is, you are holding the Messiah. You are holding the Messiah. A word of knowledge, no other way she would have known that. Ananias and Saul. Ananias is some guy who is living in Damascus. Saul's going there to actually persecute people. And uh, he has this encounter with Jesus. He, Jesus talks to him and says, hey, you know, you're, leave my people alone. He's kind of discombobulated. He's actually blinded. He's lying there in somebody's home for three days. He's not even eating. He can't see. And Ananias has this word where he says, go and talk to Saul and pray for him. And, 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 Saul, and, and Ananias goes, hey, that's the guy who's trying to hurt us. And God speaks to him and says, no, no, things have changed. It's not like that anymore. There's no way Ananias would have known that. And he goes up and he tells Paul that. He already knows Paul's whole story. Paul doesn't have to tell him. He shows up with that information. Lastly, uh, and I'm just pulling out. There's, the Bible's filled with these examples. But you have Jesus who goes through Samaria. It was a, a region in, in Israel that 
people didn't really, the Jews tried to avoid. He goes through it. His disciples go on. He's kind of, they're going to get lunch or something. He's, he's staying there outside the town next to a well, and this lady comes out. And they start engaging in this, this conversation. And she says, um, she's talking to him, and, and they, they engage about her per, some of her personal life. And he says, hey, I know, and she didn't tell him this, but he goes, Jesus says, you've been married five times, and the person you're living with now is not your husband. Well, he knew her situation. There's no way for him to, in fact, she's surprised. She goes, how did you know that? This is amazing. Well, that's because he had this, this, this word. And it also said, it carries another message. If you've been married five times, it means, it means there's some pain there. And he's saying, God cares about you. You matter. It matters where you're at in your life. And so when we, part of the reason we start to uh, move in these and pray for these gifts is because it's one of, our, one of God's ways of extending the compassion of God to people. And helping people. Uh, one time I was dreaming. Now, the people get, because God's created us so differently, we get these words or these messages differently. And, and for me, one of the ways that it, that it happens is through dreams. Uh, I had a dream once where uh, uh, I was in this guy's church. He's in town, a friend of mine, another pastor. I was in his church in the auditorium, and it was flooded. It was like uh, the water was almost up to the ceiling. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in this little boat, and, and, and he's in this, this, this little dinghy that's about to, about to go under. And so I go up, and I call up, and I say, hey, can I help you out? You know, and, I'm, and, and he's like desperate, flailing around, and then I wake up. So I decided in the morning, I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting dream. I'll call up, and I'll call him and tell him. So I call him up, and I said, hey, listen, uh, I had this dream. I described what I just told you. I said, does that resonate at all with you? He goes, no, not at all. I'm doing fine, Andy. I don't, you know, that does not connect at all. I said, is there any way I can help you? Anything I can do? He goes, ah, well, I'm doing a conference next week. You can come and hand out programs if you want. I said, no, nah, I don't think that's what the dream's about. <laughs> no. I said, okay, I'll talk to you later. Six months later, I find out he lost his job. He had to step down because he, was, he, he, had, he had a moral failure. So I talked to one of the elders. I said, well, when did that happen? He goes, oh, about six months ago was when, you know, was when that happened. That was right around the time I got the dream. And I didn't call him and match it up and figure it out. But I think if God, he spoke to me a word through a dream, but it's a word, this, this word of knowledge in order to communicate to him. I had to be faithful and do it. And he even like said, ah, that's nothing. But it wasn't nothing. It was God reaching out to him. I was praying just recently for a young woman and she's going through some problems that she didn't really tell me about it. A lot of times I'll just listen a little bit and I'll say, that's enough because God knows all what you're going through. I'm just now going to pray. And that's often how our teams will pray for people. We don't want to know everything. We just want to know a little bit just to get us started, but God knows it. So this was the situation with this, this gal. So I'm praying for her and I got this picture. And the picture was of the, these old timey barrels that have like the slats that go down them and you couldn't put water in them or rum or whatever you do. And, and, and in this picture, it was, it was, I had, she was like the, the barrel and the slats, some of them were like, were broken off and were real low. And so she couldn't get any water in because it, it kept leaking out of some of these lower slats. So I told her that. I said, I think God wants to pour in your life, but there's something going on where it's draining out. And, and God wants to do some healing in your life. And I told her this picture of the barrel. She starts to, she starts to cry. And I said, well, what's going on? She goes, well, my maiden name is Bender. And she goes, and we are, it comes from a history of we used to make barrels just like you described. She goes, and, and so she goes, that resonates. And then, and then she started telling me what she was going through. And, and God did some significant healing. Now, I wouldn't have known somebody's maiden name, right? I mean, you use your maiden name for like, Security passwords, right? And that's one of the options. Maiden name, you know. Nobody knows that. I don't need to know that. God knew it. And God used that in order to speak a word or a message of knowledge to this person. And so it takes you stepping out, trusting God. I think God's speaking to you, many of you. And you just got to be willing to step into that and do that. And, and certainly pray for that. Say, God, I want to be used in that way. Then you have the message of wisdom. The word of wisdom, where God wants to use what you know 
as a Christ follower, as you start to understand God's word, he wants to use that and build on that and give wisdom. It says, to one there is given through the spirit of the message of wisdom. So here's how I would define it. Taking scriptural principles and ideas and knowing how and when to apply them. And so God wants to use you, but with wisdom, you got to know kind of what God has to say. That's why it's important to be in the Bible. And you go, God, speak to me. I want to I have wisdom. See, wisdom is something that God gives. You can be real smart. There's brilliant people out there. There's brilliant people that have technical skills. There's brilliant lawyers, but they have no idea how to live life the way God wants them to live. There's people that are brilliant researchers and brilliant college professors, but they have no idea how to make their marriage work. And they're on their third or fourth or fifth marriage, and even that one's collapsing. You have people that are brilliant and all kinds of brilliant businessmen. They know how to close a deal. They know how to make money. They know how to grow a business. But they're clueless on how to make a life that really counts. They know how to do uh, uh, an, an, an ROI sheet, but they don't know how to do an E-ROI sheet, an eternal re- return on investment. And that's what God wants to give you wisdom. But you can't do that if you're caught up in just in this life only. And so God wants to speak into your life. And that's a lot of where wisdom comes from. A couple examples in the Bible. Solomon, really wise guy. I mean, he was, but he was raised under good tutelage with King David who wrote the Psalms. And I mean, he, he understood God's word. And so he counseled out of that. One example is he had two moms come to him. These two moms lived together in an apartment. They were, they were actually prostitutes, but they lived together alone in an apartment. They happened to get pregnant at the same time and actually had children around. This. They had two babies, both born just three days apart. And the one that had the baby that was born later, she rolled on her baby at night and actually smothered it and killed her child. And so she was very deceptive. She gets up in the middle of the night and swaps babies, takes the live baby, and puts the dead baby on next to her friend. And, and so when her friend wakes up, she looks, realizes her baby's dead. But then she starts noticing, that's not my baby. I, you know, moms know that. This is not my baby. That, 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 that lady swapped. Nobody could solve that. So it ends up getting pushed all the way up to King Solomon. So these two ladies are right there. And, and, and they tell their story. One lady says, hey, this is my baby. This one says, no, that's my baby. And they're both blaming each other. And so he comes up with this solution. He goes, okay. Uh, He calls one of his soldiers over. He goes, pull out a sword, cut the live baby in half and give each one half. Well, the the lady who had stole the baby, she goes, yeah, that's fair. I get it. You know, The, the lady who is actually the mother goes, no, 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 go ahead and just give her the baby. And Solomon goes, that is the mother. And he, and he goes, give her the baby. And and everybody's going, wow, that's so wise. But see, he had learned about justice. He had learned about God's fairness and and, and God's truth. And then out of that built his wisdom counsel and the counsel that he gave. You have Jesus and the devil. Jesus is, if you know his story before he starts his earthly ministry, he gets tempted three times by the devil. The second temptation is the sparring match with God's word. See, devil knows God's word too. God and devil's you know, speaking it out to Jesus, trying to throw him off his game. It says, then the devil took Jesus to the holy city, and that's in Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. The devil says, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now he's quoting from Psalm 91, the greatest uh, psalm on protection, really the greatest chapter on God's protection in the whole Bible. You want to know what God feels about how he wants to protect you? You go to Psalm 91. He quotes from that. And then he says, he will command his angels concerning you. Now, he misquotes him actually right there. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You know, he's just quoting scripture. Have you ever had that where you're like talking to somebody and they like quote a scripture? And they usually pull it out of context, right? And they misquote it anyways. You can, you can just be, th- you don't have to say it, but you can think, well, the devil does that all the time, you know? Pulls it out of context, misquotes it. That's what's happening here. Jesus answered him, though. He says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So he, knows, he knows God's word as well. That's how wisdom comes out. You've got to know God's word so that you don't get tripped up. 
Then you have Jesus and the successful businessman. Jesus has this encounter with this businessman who's very, very successful, very, very powerful. And he comes up, and he's actually lived a very moral life. And he says, hey, I've lived a really moral life, Jesus. What should I do next? And so Jesus kind of goes through the list. He goes, well, you know, you, you can't murder, you can't commit adultery, you can't lie, you can't uh, covet, you, you have to honor your father and your mother. You know, and, and the guy goes, I've done all those. And so Jesus says, okay, here's your next step. And we talk a lot about next steps here. If you're in a small group, we ask all of our small group leaders to be working with their small groups to help everybody should know their next step. And everybody has a next step, including me. I mean, we all have, okay, where's my next step? Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's you've not put your faith in Christ yet. You need to do that. You've not been water baptized. You need to do that. You need to go through growth track. I mean, sometimes it's easier, but sometimes it's not as easy. And you don't want to just throw something out, so you need to be prayerful about it. God, what's the next step? Jesus gives this advice. He, he doesn't give this advice to anybody else in the Bible, but to this guy, he goes, you need to sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and follow me. That was his next step. You go, boy, that's a tough step. What was his next step? How did he know? Wisdom. He had wisdom. Jesus and the Samaritan woman, I already mentioned that story. Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. She also needs a next step. She's talking, she's standing by this well, and they get into this religious conversation. And she's going, yeah, I try to keep some rules, and I worship, you know, the God up on that mountain on Mount Gerizim. And, and uh, she, basically, she's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be religious, but it's not working out that well, you know. And, G, and Jesus says, well, you need something more than religion. You need living water. You need Jesus. You need Jesus in your life. He's really talking about himself. She figures that out. She ends up going to her town there and says, hey, you need to come and see this guy. He is the Messiah. He's the real deal. And so some of you, that's your next step. You need your, you've been trying all the other ways. And you need living water, something that will deeply satisfy your soul. And so there it is, wisdom. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. It begins there. You, you should ask God who gives generously. He doesn't want to hold it back without holding or finding fault. In other words, sometimes we just shoot ourselves in the foot. Why? Well, I'm, not, I'm not worthy. You know, I'm not good enough. He says, no, no, he doesn't find fault. He loves, he's a generous, wealthy father who loves to give gifts to his children. And so you ask. You go, you go and you say, God, I need, I need wisdom. I, need, I think this is the most common prayer of all. I really do. I mean, isn't that one of your most common prayers? God, I need help. I need, I need to know what to do about my kids. I need to know how to navigate this in my marriage. I need to know what is my next step and for my own spiritual life. God, help me to know, should I do this surgery, new surgical procedure or not? Should I take this new experimental medication or not? What should I do, Lord, about my, my, my aging parents? How, do I, how am I supposed to help them and give them good direction? I mean, on and on and on. God wants to give you wisdom, but he says you need, you need to ask. This last verse, he says, we have not received the spirit of the world. So there is another worldly spirit that they... they they think they're wise. They think they know all those things. But he says, there's a greater wisdom that God gives. He says, it's the Spirit who is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom. So there's a human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. God wants to give you clarity in words in your life. Now, part of this, you pray for yourself. You go, God, I need wisdom. But sometimes we are called upon to pray for others. That's part of the role of the church. That's why we don't just sit at home and never go to church. I mean, part of going to church is we're there. We pray for one another. And when you're praying for somebody, which I hope you do, here's some rules of engagement, okay? Rules of engagement. Number one is don't expect perfection. You might get it wrong. You might not get it right. You might say things wrong, and you're kind of trying to figure things out. And so don't expect perfection. Secondly is, is don't say the Lord saith. Because you know what? It might not be the Lord. He might not be saying, saying it. It might be you with, you know. So, so 
So what we like, the way we like to pray is to say, I think God might be saying this. And we kind of, that way it kind of lowers the pressure and, you know, and it's not so heavy. And if it's God, it's going to still resonate. It's still going to hit him. Okay? Also, if possible, pray in teams. There's something powerful that happens. Jesus, he talks about praying in teams. So there's a greater level of anointing. Something happens in a team. There's also, you can bounce stuff off when you're trying to hear from God because the Bible says we hear in part, we see in part, we don't get it all. And so praying in teams can be real powerful. That's why we pray up here in teams. You see, nobody's ever alone when we pray at the end of our services. We gather together in teams. Don't be hesitant to say, hey, I, didn't, I missed that one. That was, I guess that wasn't God. And, and, and we celebrate risk-taking. John Wimber, I mentioned him earlier, he used to say, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. If you want to grow in your faith, you've got to be willing to risk-take. And then remember, we have kingdom theology, not faith theology. You see, faith theology, and maybe some of you have been exposed to that, is as if somebody prays for you to get healed and you're not healed. It's because you don't have enough faith. It's a real shaming thing, right? Real shaming thing. And, it, and we already looked at God doesn't always heal people. God has, I mean, sometimes we see in the Bible people, you know, Peter would walk by somebody who's sick day after day, week after week. And then on a particular day, that guy gets healed. Why? why, why what, what's different about that day than other days? Sometimes we don't know those things. But we have a kingdom theology. God's kingdom is breaking in. Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We want God's kingdom to come. We're not into shaming and blaming people. We're just trusting God and we're stretching ourselves in that area. Okay? Now, I've talked to a number of counselors over the years. Sometimes they're my counselor. And they've all told me that the person who gets well is usually the desperate person. I mean, we've all, if you're married, you might have done that where you go to counseling and you kind of do your dutiful thing. You're there and you show up. You answer the questions as best you can. You might even do your homework. But change never really happens until you're desperate enough. And this is a good, bad, good news, bad news situation. The good news is, the bad news is I'm sorry if you're desperate because you're probably in a difficult place. The good news is that's when God can often move the greatest. When we cry out to him, we're fully dependent on him. We're saying, God, I need you. Let's go to God right now and pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Well, Heavenly Father, come, Lord, right now. Lord, I pray specifically for those who are desperate. They need hope. Maybe you're clinging on to your faith or clinging on to a situation. You're saying, and, and it looks hopeless, actually. You're desperate. And I want to pray for you, Father. I just pray in Jesus' name that you release your level of faith and the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that you usher in your hope that you bring in. That's miraculous. That's one of the greatest miracles of all. When we walk away feeling touched, feeling that God sees us, that he knows my situation, just like the Samaritan woman. He knows my pain. He knows where I'm at. And I'm saying God knows that. He does. He cares about you. Now, we've been talking about gifts, but, you know, the, there's a giver of the gifts. And you always go to him. He's the source to all of it. If you've never put your faith in Christ, who is the giver? The head of the church. I'm going to ask you to pray right now. If you're online, if you're here in the auditorium, just to pray. Kind of just, I'm not asking you to join the church or even follow a Christian. I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm saying you should follow Christ. Follow Christ. He's the gift giver. Now let me tell you what you do. Right where you're at, you just pray this prayer. I'm going to lead you in that prayer. Right where you're at, you just say, dear God. Some of you need to pray that prayer. Dear God, I put my faith in the gift giver, Jesus Christ, today. Would you say that? Forgive me, Lord, for trying to do it on my own. Heal me. Would you say, God, resurrect hope in my heart for my life and my situation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.